Welcome to The Mystic and the Skeptic, the show that asks the tough questions and explores different alternatives to today's pressing issues, theories, or enigmas. A podcast devoted to the exploration of all things mystical, philosophical, scientific, political, conspiratorial, and cosmic. Join us in an exploration of the mystic skeptic mind space. In this week's show, our guest is Dr. Brenda Shoshana, psychologist, author, and workshop leader who provides therapy to individuals and couples who wish to find relief from stress, anxiety, depression, relationship difficulties, grief, and more. She has been in private practice in New York for over 30 years, who has been published in over 13 languages. Dr. Shoshana has provided over 500 talks and workshops on all aspects of relationships, personal and spiritual development, and creating authentic peace of mind. The topic of our program is the relationship between American Jews and Eastern thought, especially Buddhism. Dr. Brenda Shoshana is the author of 11 books, including Jewish Dharma, which focuses on common issues that introduce disorder to our lives, and how the intersection of Judaism and Buddhism can help find understanding, meaning, and a life grounded in these authentic faiths. Dr. Shoshana, tell us a little bit about your background, and also if you can share with us how did these two faiths connect in your life, and how these traditions um, became a part of, of, of your practice. Well, thank you very much for having me on. It's, it's lovely to be here with you. Um, I was raised in a very uh, Hasidic, actually, to a very, very, very intense Jewish background, and um, in, in almost felt like another century, you know, in very ancient ways and very strong practice, which was very, very, very beautiful and also very d difficult for me because I tend to be very independent thinker, you know. I like to filter everything f through my own being. So this practice, the practice of Judaism, along with having great, deep impact upon me, and it also woke me up to many, many questions in my life. And right along with it, I, when I was about 14 years old, I became introduced to, to Zen, oddly enough, a teacher in, in school gave me a little book to read, and it was set on Zen, which also really captured my heart and my thought. And... Um, so both of these practices have been a part of my life since I've been quite young, uh, and um, they still are. <laughs> I'm not so young anymore physically, but they still, they've gone. They've taken me through my whole lifetime, and I've taken them. And naturally, as you keep practicing, they've changed, they've morphed, they've my understanding has has kind of deepened. It takes a long time. It's not a quick a quick overnight process. The 25th anniversary of the publishing of the book, The Jew and the Lotus, um, just happened. Uh, for those not familiar with the book, uh, Roger Kamenitz spoke about um, how Jews have been involved in Buddhism. Uh, there was conversations with the Dalai Lama. There was, um, um, what's the leader of the Renewal Movement who uh, was very involved with uh, interfaith um, relations? With the interfaith um Oh, I think he just passed away, didn't he, recently? Uh, yeah, no, I, I think so. I, I'm, I'm not really sure. I'm not particularly involved in that movement myself. But um, I know people who are. Right now, I think it's uh, Rabbi David Ingber, who's one of the main spokesmen, and Marsha Prager and so forth. So can you give us a brief description of the relationship of American Jews with Zen and how has this impacted the Jewish community of the U.S.? Well, that's <clears throat> that's quite a question. <clears throat> I'll tell you that, um, first of all, my, when I began training, actually, in Zen, after I, the, I re began reading the books when I was quite young, but till I found the, my actual teachers and, and found the practice of Zen, it took many, many years. And then I began sitting and training with Son Roshi, uh, who came from Japan, and, and this is, I want to say this, it's important. The actual practice of sitting in Zazen and practicing Zazen, it's, it's not B Buddhism per se. From Son Roshi's point of view, and I take this too, I don't take it as a religion. I take Zazen practice as a practice of being human, 
and of making everything in my life rich and full and beautiful. And, and when I sit and practice, everything takes on a new meaning to me. So it's not, although many, many people do take precepts and become p- 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 Buddhist per se, I never did that because as I, I worked closely with Soen for a long time, and even, even my other teachers who were in the Rinzai Zen tradition, there was no pressure for me to become a, a, a Buddhist, and I felt that I didn't want to label myself in that way because, you know, the essence of Zen is who is the t- true man of no form. It's not about a label, and it's not about identifying yourself through some kind of a a transmission with a name and a label, and it's not bad. Zen is like the pure mountain air that just blows naturally. So that's an important point to make. I don't see it as a religion. I see it as a very deep and important practice for all people, whether or not they believe in God. It doesn't matter. If you garden, if you love to paint, whatever you do, Zazen, is something that will really be very meaningful to you. Um, That said... To go back and answer your question about the Jewish community, you know, I, that's a very complicated question because the Jewish community, the ones who are really pra- who are practicing Judaism, have almost no interest in Zen practice at all. So we, when you say the Jewish community, I, the community, I mean, I've met many, many, many Jewish people in the Zendos, of course, but these are not practicing Jews. Only one, only one person in all the years I met, and I've been involved in this, the Zen practice and Judaism for over 40 years now, only one person actually practiced Judaism. And I also, though, kept practicing Judaism along with my Zen practice. But most, actually most of the Jews that I met, uh, were born Jewish or they're culturally Jewish, but they but but their practice is Zen. That was this has been my experience. It has been Zen practice, and they I haven't seen any any desire to integrate it with Judaism, which is very interesting to me because when I wrote this book Jewish Dharma, that was my wish to show the the Jewish people how the great beauty of Zen practice and to show all the Jewish Zen practitioners the great beauty of Jewish practice. And I found, um, to my great surprise, (laughs) that the Jewish people had no interest in learning about Zen practice and that the Zen practitioners had very, very little, if no interest in learning about Judaism at all. So how, if you're talking about the practices, I don't think that they've affected one another by and large. This, this isn't true of the Catholics. Though. By the way, the Catholics are the ones who really love my books, which is such a, was such a strange uh, experience for me. But they were the ones who really loved Jewish Dharma and understood it. And um, I do notice that many Catholics uh, in the country practice Catholicism and Zen together simultaneously. I'm close to uh, Robert Kennedy Roshi and his wonderful sanghas, and, and that happens there. But in terms of the Jewish community, I don't see any real overlap. We had uh, Dr. J. Michelson on the show, and he, he uh, says that he practices both faiths. And, um, but the challenge that I have for him is that American Buddhism is different from East, the Eastern kind of religious observance. And we were talking about more traditional, um, like Chinese Buddhism that is very uh, ritual oriented. It has to do with ancestor worship. It has to do with life cycles. So that we saw, found some commonalities. But um, the one thing that um, we kept on bumping into was this idea of of what spirituality means and he defines spirituality as intuitive wisdom and somehow uh, in his uh, religious um, you know life walk uh, he couldn't find that in in Judaism so he had to venture out to to, to another faith and I was struggling with that uh, being Jewish myself because I, I've, I think that Judaism has uh, a strong spirituality, but it's not in the Eastern sense. No, but, but you know that's that, that that's that's what most people think, and that's very it's so sad to me to hear people say that. And I know that that that's what everybody thinks that because of the generation we're in. But the truth is that when Judaism is practiced wholeheartedly, 
It has the most deep spirituality you could even imagine. It's full of meditation. It's full of intuitive with intuitive. But me, listen, one of the main one of the main teachings is God says, "Come to me directly, not to not through a man, not through a messenger, not through a teaching." That's right in the Torah. Now that is exactly what we do in Zen. We sit down in Zazen. We go directly, go directly to God. But also there are so many practices in Judaism to go directly to God and to open up one's intuitive wisdom. For instance, Rabbi Nachman, I don't know if you know him, a great, great teacher, he has a practice of hit bodudut, which is the practice, one of the most powerful practices and actually the great, great uh, teachers who even brought down the Kabbalah were doing hit boat to do And you know what that practice is? You stay alone. You do this hopefully for an hour a day. All by yourself. You sit alone under a tree or by yourself and you speak out loud to God as if you were speaking to your best friend. But for one full hour. You just keep speaking and speaking and it is so intense because all of a sudden a moment of great silence will come and speak about intuitive knowing. So much comes, such, so, so many responses come to you as you keep doing this. I mean, that's just one practice. But sadly, you know, um, and, and I know Jay Michelson, pers- I know him personally and I like him a great deal and I have tremendous respect for him. So I'm not, I'm not, Saying that, saying that there's anything wrong with his practices, actually they're quite wonderful. But what I'm saying is that so many Jews, and, and, and not only Jewish people, but all people, are not just not aware of what's really packed there in the Torah, the gifts, the treasures. And, and when I sat a lot, and I do, I sit a lot. Now, in fact, for Rosh Hashanah, we had the Zen Shul here. We had we, it was beautiful. Celebrate preparation for Rosh Hashanah. We did hours of sitting, and we did meditation on scripture, and we had wonderful chanting of the Hebrew melodies. I mean, it was really, really beautiful combination of the two. But, but, but there seems to be in in this generation anyway some kind of a, an aversion to looking more deeply into what Torah practice really is. There just is. Uh, they say it's not there, or. It's not for me or, you know, because I guess we see many displays of it that might not be very, very something that we feel drawn to. You know, we see people practicing and it may not look very good, but but the true Torah is not, that's not the true Torah. Well, tell us about your congregation and and what are the things that uh, you experience there? Oh, I can't call it a congregation. It's just, it's just. Everybody's equal here. It's just a few of us, you know, the people who love to come, people who sit and who are involved in Judaism. We do Zazen together. We, especially, we do a lot of preparation for the holidays and also for the Sabbath. We're going to start doing more of that. And, and we'll, we'll sit a lot and then we'll, we'll do the Hebrew chanting, chanting Avinu Malkenu or some of the other chants on and on for a long time. And then we, do a beautiful practice called Lectio Divina. I, I don't know if you know that practice where you you work with a few paragraphs very slowly of the, we use the Tehillim, the Psalms, or some other scripture. Any scripture could be used. And then we take that into Zazen and meditate on it and then look and see what it, what it is saying for our lives, what we're being asked to do, what's being asked of us. And, and it, then we talk, we have a little discussion about it. We have many different things that we do. And um, for me, I have a great, great longing to integrate the sitting, the silence, the simplicity, and the, and the Jewish practice. And also the welcoming. We welcome everybody. It doesn't matter what your religion, race, or anything is. Everyone is welcome. And to me, that's a very big part of Torah, too, because one of the biggest mitzvahs is welcome the stranger everybody to be welcome. If you look at what the true Torah is, there's no room for any prejudice or rejection of anyone at all. All of it that's come up over the years is a mistake. Weeds, you know, weeds in the garden that have to be pulled out. 
we all have, there are weeds in every garden, but if you really look at the Torah, I mean, it's quite different from what people think. And so that's always been my wish to do it in a very tr- simple and a very welcoming and in a very authentic way. And to really do it, you know, not just to say it, but to live it, to really try as much as possible to live it. Am I talking too much? No, this we want to get in depth uh, about the subject. Um, I have some tough questions, so please uh, bear with me. Um, in the book uh, Jewish Dharma, you connect different Jewish concepts with Zen ones. Is it possible to do this, or do we have to stretch the definition of the concepts? No, no, no. You know, no, no, because it's it's the same thing. It's you know, it's the same exact thing. For instance, like which concepts are you referring to? Well, you have uh, prayer uh, in relation to Zazen, Torah study in relation to Quran, the Misvot in relation to mindfulness. Uh, so. Mm-hmm. Well, no, because, well, let's take the Misvot, for instance. That is mindfulness practice. I mean, it's not a question, it's not about a concept. It's what is, what is mindfulness? See, Zazen trains us. It's a training in being very mindful, as along with many other things. When you sit a lot, you begin to really pay attention. It's like it's like going to a gym. You know, when you work out certain muscles in the gym, well, when you sit, you work out the muscle of mindfulness and being very attentive and being very awake. It just happens as you sit a lot. Then you take that mindfulness and you can apply it when you do the mitzvot. You, you're attentive. You're awake. You're conscious. And the mitzvot themselves of our practice of being mindful, being aware. For instance, at certain times when you do certain things to, to make certain blessings, you bless God, all of that is to keep you becoming very mindful of the presence of God in your life. It's not a concept. It's an action. There's no difference between the two. I mean, the forms are different. You sit in order to increase your awareness and awakeness but also the mitzvot, they are, it's, it's an enormous practice of mindfulness, is, of being aware, of being awake, for instance. You don't just go barging through your relationships or going through lives, not paying attention. One of the biggest mitzvahs is when somebody works for you, to pay them immediately. When a worker finishes a job for you, you need to pay them immediately. Why is that? So Because why do they tell you to do it? Because most of us are not mindful and aware that maybe the worker really needs this income or he has to pay for food for his family or something like that. So the mitzvah, it, it wakes you up to so many things and to be mindful, to be aware. And, and so if you do that, that particular mitzvah, and there are many, many of them, you'll become aware of that person who's working for you, what their needs are, and, and you view them differently. It's not just concepts, it's actions. So the same goes for keeping the Sabbath and not doing for... Of course, because let's go into that one. Let's go into keeping the Sabbath. What is, when you keep the Sabbath, you take your, it's the same thing as, as non-doing, as, as sitting in Zen, because what are you doing? You're taking your hands off the world. There are all these, they call it halacha or rules or regulations about what you may not do and what you may do on the Sabbath. Of course, I flop in myself all the time. But the thing is that what they really are, they're a structure. Like if you go, if you're going to do karate, there's a structure that certain moves you do make, you don't make. And through that structure, the whole, everything progresses. So when you, in, in on the Sabbath, you don't cook, you don't shop, you don't turn on the television, you don't drive. Why? Why? Because you're letting go of everything, non-doing. You're giving the whole day over to the, to God and letting God do everything. Okay, now when you sit in Zazen, you don't move. You hold your posture till the sitting is over. You don't, if you feel pain, you don't rub your leg or change your position. Why? You're giving everything over. You're letting every, you're not interfering. You're letting everything that happens in that period of time take care of itself on the Sabbath the whole day long is a day of mindfulness of God a day of prayer and you're not it's not about your personal will on that day a larger will it's about not doing it's a, it's a larger and a day of deep rest 
and so a larger will comes upon you. See, these aren't concepts. They're just descriptions of... The Torah is really a, a book of actions, not just of ideas. It's to, be, it's to be lived and tasted and put into practice. Just the way Zen is, sometimes people read and read and read and talk about it, but then they haven't even begun to know what Zen is until they actually sit on the cushion and practice. And the same is true for the Torah. Well, do you, do you feel the same about uh, traditional Kabbalah? Because another um, debate we had about the way that maybe the Kabbalah Center or some people who... Uh, have popularized Kabbalah is that uh, they are describing it away from its traditional um, perspective. And if you study tra uh, Kabbalah intellectually or academically, there's a lot of theorizing, there's a lot of very complicated concepts. And other than the Hasidim with practical Kabbalah, it's, it's hard to implement. So So the question that we had was, Can you really live out Kabbalah in a way that people live out Zen or other forms of Buddhism? Well, I, I don't go to... I, I, I'm not really a student of Kabbalah, to tell you the truth. I, I haven't been... I mean, I've read a little bit up here and there. It doesn't... I, I, I'm, I'm really more prefer for me. I'm more like... A, I'm, I, it's not my cup of tea. So I don't, I don't think about it. I prefer to actually jump into the, the mitzvot themselves. And, to, you know, it's, it says in the Torah, if you want to know if this is true, rather than think about it and get involved in all these concepts, it says, if you want to know if it's true, just do it, and you will see. It says, do, and you will see. And that's exactly the Zen, the Zen point also. The Zen is also about do. When you're finished sitting, just clean the floor. Just wash your teacup. Just take care of what's in front of you to do. And Torah is, there's so much to actually, if it's a question of take some of the mitzvot and actually do them and you'll see for yourself. Kabbalah is very beautiful. It's much more advanced. It's, it just has never, it's never been my particular path, so I can't talk about it. I like the Musser teachings a little more, but it's not my particular way, so uh, that's, I'm not a good person to discuss that part with. There's a gentleman, uh, Yitzhak Boxbaum, who's also part of the Renewal Movement, and in a lecture he was saying that for him, Hinduism helped him give give him perspective about Juda Judaism, that, that he was able to compare and contrast both faiths. Is that pretty much what uh, the premise of your book, that if you study other faiths and you learn um, from them, that you can actually appreciate your own tradition a little bit better? Well, the truth is, I, I didn't. I didn't say that in those words, but I really that that's been true for me. You said it very beautifully. I mean, my my actual study and practice of of Zen has really, really opened up my ability to deeply appreciate Judaism and to practice it much better with with, with a clear mind, not to do it out of rote, not to do it out of rote. You know, unfortunately. So many things in all the different religions are done out of guilt, habit, or rote. Do you, do you, you know what I mean? We just do what we're supposed to, or we go to, we go to a, a celebration for the holiday because it's a family dinner or family obligation or for all of those reasons. But to me, I never wanted to practice that way. I always wanted to do it with my full heart. And, and, and to do it, it's called with kavana, with intention and devotion. And so what, yes, for me, practicing and studying Zen has really, really enriched my prayer and my understanding of Judaism and, and of many things, but in particular of my own faith. I, I don't understand it the way, in, in maybe by, by rote, or the way I might have when I was a child, but things become deeper and more, more open for me. And I, I've, I've heard many people say that about Hinduism, because in Hinduism, they, they just talk about God differently, a little bit differently, and because of the meditations. So, you know, to me, at this point, I find them over, I always have, but I find them even now, they're all of, like, all fingers on one hand, all one God, and all beautiful different ways of describing the practice of connecting with God. 
So whichever one really touches you, that's, that's, that's a beautiful thing and a very big gift. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'm not afraid of studying other religions. I enjoy, I think it's good to also understand them because we live in a world, a multicultural world with many people and many religions, and it's a way of being c closer to others and not to see them as threats. But as just, I see everybody along the way with me, fellow journeymen on the way. Do you think that um, interfaith dialogue is um, active and and impacting um, modern society, or did it die in the '70s and now people are, have become more entrenched in their views? That's such a good question, isn't it? It's a beautiful question. I worked with a Rabbi Gelberman. I don't know if you know who he was. He was one of my closest friends for 35 years. He was one of the first people to bring interfaith into this country, and. Um, You know, it's very interesting. I was very close friends with him, and I would always give workshops at his many, many seminaries, and he would have seminaries for people of all. His wish was to bring the world together so there wouldn't be any more pain and, and, and it would to knock down the prejudice and to see the oneness. And he himself had lost a lot of family in the Holocaust, including his wife, daughter. He'd lost, he'd gone through terrible pain, but his reaction to that was, now I'm going to live enough for everybody which was so beautiful, and I never heard him angry with anyone. He always tried to create understanding between people, so I, I thought that was extremely beautiful. Um, I, it, they were very, I miss him terribly. He passed away when he was 98 years old, and, and I never heard him speak ill of anyone. I always, and he welcomed everyone. So I don't know how, I, I know that there are interface programs going on now and people trying that. It seems to me, I think the world is right now, from my point of view, from what I could see, it's, it's a little scary to me that people are they're becoming much more rigidified in their own position and much more anger and hatred toward others, which is very, very, very sad to me and very frightening. It's a very sad situation, a time for a lot more prayer and a lot more meditation for all of us. Do you practice uh, silence uh, retreats and... What practices do you think are important for people to grow and become more connected with themselves and each other? That's uh, such a good, it's a beautiful, beautiful question. Well, well, for many, many, I'm a little bit older now. I've been you know, all my life, instead of, I never went on vacation. I always went to what we call sessions, which were seven days sitting <laughs> um, in the mountains with my teacher and others. And we sat, we did Zazen from five, six in the morning, four in the morning till nine at night for seven days in a row. So I certainly, for years and years and years, I practiced many, many long hours of sitting. And then they were very, very meaningful and very helpful. I, we, I still do that, but not to that extent, because I'm much older now. It's a little bit hard for me to do that much at this time. But Like this, um, in a few weeks, we're having an all-day sitting here in my house, and I do go to all-day sittings, and um, I would be happy, you know, maybe a weekend sitting. I haven't done more of the past few years, but but the question is, how do people get more connected? I think it's extremely important to find a group, a chevra, a sangha, a community pra to practice with. For me, that always was a huge support. I guess there's a period when you just need to explore and go to different places and listen and see who and what really speaks to you and what touches you and where you feel at home so that you can settle down and practice. I mean, ultimately, we come to a place we can practice everywhere and anywhere, but it's a long road till you get there, and it's very important to have a c community of people, very important. Even if it's just two or three or four people, or hopefully it's more than that, that just to share and to, and to be with because that's a big, big support in keeping going. You know, there are many, many, many Zen groups in the city. Um, there are many Jewish groups in the city, many, many, of all persuasions, many teachers, many books. So to start with, I think it's, There's a time of just searching, I guess, to look to see what practice fits for you and where you would fit in the best and feel like you want to stay there and, and join in. And, and, and you may not want to be there forever, but you may, there's something there for you to learn, to grow, to get, and then you evolve and take the next step. Does Zen have an aspect of social justice, and how does that look like? 
Oh, yeah, absolutely. Certain groups are very involved with that. They have all kinds of social programs. And um, others emphasize it a little bit less. But they, some groups really go forth. I know that they've done retreats. Uh, they've done some groups do street retreats with the homeless and, and feed, do soup kitchens and do all kinds of work. Some of the groups do and work in pr- prisons and have hospices. They do all, they take the practice and they actually work with others. Um, some practice, some, some Zen centers focus mostly on you, on you, on your own awakening. And then as you awaken and become, and become more filled with the truth and with who you are, inevitably you'll, it will come to you what to do. You want to share. You want to share. You need to share. And, and it'll come to you where to go, what to do. And, and it's left, in some cases, just more to the individual, to their own awakening, to guide them to what's meaningful for them. But other groups, I mean, many places have activities where in prisons and hospices and things like that. And people that are involved in, in community service or uh, social, uh, social work or any type of uh, service field, they get uh, drained and you know, one of the new concepts that is taking a hold is uh, self-care. Do you think that within Zen and, and um, the Judaism that you are uh, sharing, is uh, is the concept of self-discipline a way to, like, recharge your batteries and be able to be more effective? In... Oh, my goodness, absolutely. I mean, particularly, I know for you, you know, by the way, I'm, I've retired from seeing private patients now, I but I do offer workshops which called Entering the House of Love, which has to do with releasing, the releasing, the Sedona releasing method, and, and other things like all the years that I saw patients, I went to the Zendo all the time, and it was incredible, there was no better self-care in the world, because I had that wonderful time in, in meditation, and it cleared away whatever needed to be cleared, and it, it took away the stress, and it gave me so much strength and support to continue. So uh, you cannot give to others unless you've been given to as well. It's, it's a loop. And, and when you undertake the right spiritual practice for you, it's so nourishing. You receive so much. You receive so much from it that you just want to share it. And giving to others, then, it is, it's very natural and, it, and it's easy. And it doesn't have to be draining at all. Wonderful. Um, the Transcendentalists were fascinated with Eastern thought in... Now there's the Universalist Unitarian community. Um, but I've seen within the Jewish community an openness to yoga and meditation. Uh, there's groups, Orthodox groups in Israel who are trying to incorporate the Hebrew letters and the poses and things like that. So you think that um, it is a little bit more acceptable, kind of like karate, that people don't connect it with, um, with a different type of religion. They see it more as a form of exercise or a form of inner growth? I hope so. I, I deeply, I mean, I can't say it's as an exercise, although, but I would say it's a deep practice of being the best human being you could be. It's universal. It's for everyone. I mean, I, I was study for a while with Kuder, K- 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 and he had a, a, a Zendo in Israel in Mount Olives for many years. I actually met him in Israel. Um, he was one of my he was my teacher's um, student, and um, but no, it's of course I, I'm, I hope and I hope and pray that that all the religions. Can you imagine if all the religions really began to do meditation? How one that uh, they they would there would not be any more wars. They just wouldn't because people would see the good in each other and the beauty and the similarity in each other. I mean, when you sit a lot or do any of the yoga a lot, I haven't done yoga, I'm a sitter, but when you sit a lot, you just see the, the oneness. Adonai Echad, God is one. You actually live it, you see it, and there's it it is no reason for prejudice and rejection of others. There's just no reason for it. it you know, in a garden, there are many, many flowers. Each flower is beautiful. The roses don't start hating the tulips. It's crazy that human beings have come in, and, and very dangerous that we've come into that position. So I hope it's more acceptable. It would be wonderful. Nothing would make me happier than to see that all over. As a therapist, do you um, share with people the scientific studies that, that show that meditation and prayer um, help with the creative part of the brain and for people to have 
a healthier um, you know, lifestyle? Well, you know, as I said, I'm not practicing as a therapist right now. When I was a therapist, I did share as I was in practice with those who seemed that interested in it, those who seemed to want it. It wasn't something I ever pushed them. I never pushed anything on anyone. I might offer it or, or explain about it. And if they were interested and they wanted it, certainly. Because you know what? You have to have a taste for it. It's like having a taste for a certain kind of food. Some people love Indian food. Some love Thai food. You know, it's not for everyone. But if, if Zazen isn't for everyone, then there's something else is for them. I always encourage everyone to find what it is that works for them, that, that they really feel connected to. But certainly now, in, in my days, there weren't so many studies about it. But now, of course, there's so many scientific studies, and I'm so happy that they're there because I'm truly hoping that that will include it in the curriculum. Can you imagine if they did this for children in schools as well? Oh, my goodness. So many of the young people are taking a consider they have ADHD. They take medication of all kinds for all kinds of stress. This could easily be reduced if, if, if they did 10, 15, 15 minutes a day of sitting. So I wish it would be everywhere. I truly do. And I wish it would not be seen necessarily as of another religion because it isn't really. It truly isn't. You know, the P Buddha said, I'm a doctor who's come to cure the ills of the world. That's what he said. He didn't say I'm a great religious leader or I'm an enlightened being. He, he was very enlightened, but he said, I'm a, I'm a doctor who's come to cure the ills of the world. We've all been shot with poison arrows, and I'm going to show you how to pull the poison arrows out. How beautiful is that, right? So beautiful, so simple. And, and he showed what the poison arrows were and how to pull it out. Now, this is nothing, this is, a, this is for every religion. It's not in opposition to anything at all. For a long time, uh, Judaism had like a rationalist um, branch of it that tried to like do away with a lot of the mystical stuff, kind of ignore that and focus on the practical uh, issues. So, has has that happened in, in in Zen or in Buddhism where um some of the the more um kinda spiritual or um almost like paranormal things uh are dismissed or do you also in a, in a, that's the thing also we discussed about American Buddhism that American Buddhism is uh, in some people's practice is very secular and it kinda and it takes away from some of the mystical aspects of Chinese Buddhism or, or Japanese Buddhism. Um, in in your experience, is there um, mystical elements that are integrated, or is it mostly just based on personal growth? No, of course, it's extremely deep. It's one of the most mystical practices you can imagine. What do you think happens when you sit seven days and seven, for 16 hours a day with no speaking? <laughs> you sit and you walk and you sit and you only speak with your teacher. You go into such an incredible place in yourself. I mean, you, your life has changed forever when you come home from one of those sessions. It's it's very you, this, you have very profound experiences of yourself, of the universe, of what you're doing here. It's extremely spiritual and deep practice. And and you know what? And everybody does this in whatever way they're ready for, in whatever way works for them. Some people, like even in Japan, they say now, there's not so many young people sitting anymore. There, it's mostly Buddhist temples where they go to do ceremonies and things for for families and ancestors. I, I, I mean, I, it really, it, Buddhism can be a family, very beautiful, nothing wrong with that either, but it can have different manifestations in different times in different parts of the world and yes there are some people who use it like they might use a yoga just to feel good like a like an anti-anxiety medication it could be used that way and that's you know and and the truth is that that's just what when you begin to feel a lack of stress and you feel better that's a side effect of zen it's a side effect it's not if you go deeper and if you're drawn into it more deeply the side effect is there but that's not you go, there's something deeper than that, even that comes to you and that's available. But you know what? The practice itself will guide you. For some people, that's all they want is some, a lack of anxiety or whatever, and that's fine. That's fine. That's where they're at right now. I wouldn't judge anyone. 
because Zazen is infinite. It has infinite gifts and capabilities, and it will, it will do the work for you. It will take you just where you belong. And, and for some people in this life, that's, that's what they want. That's, that's all. That's where they're up to. That's what works for them. That's fine. But for others, I know many, many people who've devoted their lives to going to sessions right here in this country and, and sitting a lot and going very deep into the real reason for their being alive and what, and, and, and for who they are and for, to, to address very, very deep questions. I saw a video where Rabbi Schneerson was pretty much condemning uh, meditation, and it was um, it was like a retaliation against so many secular Jews leaving Judaism and becoming interested in, in Eastern thought. And it was this idea of you know you're going out there to that stuff, and and it, it was like a, a very narrow view uh, without. Uh, looking at, you know, there is Jewish meditation. There's been Orthodox rabbis who have written about that. But it was this, this like, this fear that people were leaving in, in droves to o other faiths. And they even put a, a Chabad house in India. So when Israelis pass through, they have a connection to, to Jewish stuff. Um, what's a more expanded, a more educated perspective where, uh, like we've been talking about, people can go experience and try things out from other places and, and maybe return or, or, or expand their view of Judaism? Well, you know, you know the, Reb, the Rebbe's, Rebbe Schneerson, he, he was, you know, his, I, I, you know, I was involved in the early days in a big dialogue with him and with other people about meditation directly. There was a bunch of us and there was a lot. I, I, was, I, was, I still have his letters in my house here. And, and I, I, and I know what you're referring to, that he ultimately said, no, don't do this. It's dangerous. That was his view. And I, which, of, to which I completely disagreed. But, but, but I understood his reason for it. I wouldn't say it was so much revenge. I would say that instead, he, he, you're right. You're very right. He feared. You know, especially right after the Holocaust. So many Jewish people had been destroyed and wiped out, and he was afraid that well, the people who were left, whoever was left, would also be wiped away, be taken away, um, and would become would become Buddhists. Would be, would, would, you know, the, it's the concept of a fence. You put a fence around something to protect it. He was trying to protect. He was afraid that some Jews would become Buddhists or become Hindus, and they would leave. And, 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 and from his deepest heart, he felt that the best path for a Jew would, was the Torah. And so he was trying to protect them as well as to keep them uh, in the fold. There's no question he wanted them to be there because he truly believed that was where a Jew belonged. How, you know, now, from my point of view, I needed to do Zen practice for many reasons. I love it. It saved my life. And it allowed me to do Jewish practice. I couldn't have done Jewish practice without my years of sitting in the Zendo. It's, a tr it's very tricky. It's a tricky, tricky, tricky road. I've seen many people um, who, in the Zendo, many, many, many Jewish people in the Zendo, in, including many of the teachers uh, in, the, in the Zen world who are Jewish, who have absolutely no connection to Jewish practice. Sometimes I feel sad about it, but I also feel well. That's who they are. You know, they're very, they're fulfilled with this. And so I really don't feel it's up to me to say who should practice what. I don't. And I've seen people who are not Jewish being t t drawn to the Torah. And, and I kind of believe that people should, will be drawn where, they, where their soul belongs at that stage. It may not be forever. They may evolve to something else. But I don't believe it's up to me to, to tell anyone. Deeply, I don't. Even my own children, you know, or grandchildren, I don't think it's up to me to. It's such a personal thing to dictate to anyone where, what kind of spiritual practice they should do. That, that's a time of great discovery, and and it's and it's and and and, and the right practice for you at the right time. You will grow from it, and it will bring you where you ultimately belong. It will if you do it with sincerity, and authenticity, and honesty, and love. If you do it with real love, it, 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 it can only be a good thing. That's my personal view. It's not the Rebbe's view. It's my view. That's all. 
some traditional people will also have the the fear of young people having this concept of the grass is greener somewhere else and that well you know they they fear that but you know what i would say i mean i shouldn't maybe i shouldn't say this but i i feel it's up to the people i feel that young people you can't keep them by guilt and obligation and and familial bonds you need to inspire them <laughs> you need to excite them so they can't stay away you know what i mean you need to talk to them where they're at you need to create an environment that they want to be at spiritually speaking rather than saying, oh, 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 this is wrong, that's wrong, forget about it. Don't say what's always so wrong with them. Let's inspire them in a real, if you have a, if you, if there's a person who's aglow with love and shining with their practice, don't you think that's going to attract young people and everybody? So I think that's the responsibility of every spiritual leader is to, just to be filled with love and inspiration and a glow, and then whoever's supposed to be with them will come to them. It's not a business. It shouldn't be a business. Have you experienced with young people that there's like a lack of interest in anything, that uh, they're so caught up in um, popular culture and, and, and media that even thinking deeply or, or, or practicing anything um, consistently... Well, I think it, 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 sometimes it, they can become addicted, you know, to all the texting and tweeting and the whole thing. And there's a danger. There's a danger, but there's also a loneliness, I feel, and a hunger. And I think the soul and the shama is always hungry to be connected to the infinite and to the divine, always. And I think the way our culture is now, it's, just, it's very creepy in some respects that people don't talk to each other. They don't, often they don't connect, they tweet, they text, they think they've had a conversation. There's, in my view, there's not enough human contact. But on the other hand, I believe there's the longing for it and it will come back. I mean, look at all the meetup groups. Why do they have all these meetup groups? Because people want the human connections, right? So um, I think that along with... They look a little disconnected, but underneath it, I, you know, there's also a very huge epidemic of suicide. I'm sure you know that too, right? And it's a very, and why do you think that is when young people? Because of the tremendous loneliness and not being connected to themselves and to others in a healthy way. So I think it's, if anyone calls themselves a spiritual leader, a, a rabbi or a Zen master or whatever people call themselves, that it's their job to you just turn on the light to be a great inspiration. I think all these young people, whether or not they think deeply, if they see someone who's truly filled with love and kindness and aliveness, they will be drawn. Another challenge of modernization is this idea where everything is just hodgepodge, like mixed, and uh, we live in an intentional community, and um, there's a, an eclectic uh perspective on, on spirituality and eclectic uh, and egalitarian perspective on different philosophies. And uh, at times it feels like it's just all mixed together and you don't really get to experience one uh, in a, deeply and, and thoroughly. So what are the ways that you think? I agree with you. That's a big danger. And they say, just pick one thing and dig deep in the well. I agree. I, I agree that that is dangerous because because there's because what you what but spirituality. I mean, what you what you really want is a practice. So if you want to practice, you just take that practice and just do it as a Torah. So whether you like it or not, just I mean, I can't say like it and I just do it. Each practice will create obstacles, hard times. You'll be faced with conflicts. You'll be faced with yourself, but. I do think it's important to pick a practice and to really dive into it. I do. I do. You, otherwise, you can miss a great opportunity in this lifetime. It all becomes mush. And where do you live? Is there, um, like, have you been invited to uh, interfaith dialogue or places like community centers where you have people share multiple views and, and create understanding? Or is it pretty much... Um, it's a very uh, small group of people who are interested in, in expanding their views. Well, well, well you know, the, the, the groups I speak to have been connected to Rabbi Gelberman's, the interfaith and training seminars, and I've spoken to and did workshops there. 
and places like that. Um, I don't really spend that much time in the interfaith world. I just go there and I offer my workshops on Judaism or on Zen or whatever like that. Um, so I, I think Rabbi Government always said, in addition to, not instead of, that the interfaith way isn't necessarily a practice. It's in addition to your own practice, not instead of it. It's not a replacement. It's just a way of taking your own self and your own practice and learning and sharing it with others and also learning about what other people's practices are. That does go on in some of these institutes. Um, and I think that's nice. But it's not, as I see it, it's not a practice in and of itself. Is there any... Go ahead. Uh, well, we have a, a friend who uh, is part of um, one of the Zen groups in, in Japan, and there's a lot of mantras that they say, and the more you say the mantra, the, the more your life changes for the better. It, um, you mentioned doing the Abino Malkenu. Is there certain mantras that, that you practice with your, uh, your, your friends that are Jewish? And then also is there Zen ones that, that have uh, worked well for you and, and, and inspire you? Well, we, we always did a very strong morning service, Japanese morning service at the Zendo where I trained at the New York Zendo, and I, I still do the morning service, but what I, um, I love Avinu Malkainu, and, and we do different, um, some of the different nigunes, the different melodies, you know, the beautiful Hebrew melodies, on and on. That's really beautiful. You just find ones that really connect for you. And I, I know the group you're thinking of. It's the <laughs> Nam Yoha Renge Kyo, right? Is that they're the ones that do the mantras? You know, there, there, there are many, many practices, again, and it can be very overwhelming. That was one of the things that the Rebbe Schneerson was worried about, that you go out into the world in general and there's a, you get accosted by a million practices, and you can't get lost. You can't get go from this one to that one to the other one. And, you know, it's like sometimes it can be like a spiritual t tourist, tasting this, tasting that. That's why he wanted to help the Jewish people stay together and to do their, uh, their practice. A true Torah practice has everything. And I'm, I'm not just saying that. It's, it's a profound, profound, profound practice. Um, includes family, includes money, includes work, includes sexuality, includes everything. When, and, and the challenge, I think, in this day and age is to see what the Torah really says clearly. So many people are, 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 are pushed away from it because when they see it practice, they feel things about it might be full of prejudice or this or that, whatever. But the true practice is so beautiful. For instance, one of the main myths is most people don't even know this, is to judge everybody favorably. Only look for the good in everyone. Isn't that wonderful? You'd never know that, right? And you see, these are things that people aren't aware of, which is why I, I wrote Jewish Dharma a long time ago. Um, but, you know, it's sad. To me, it's sad that um, the truth of what the practice is isn't clearer. You don't have to end, but, but it is important to, do, to take something and, to, to, and not and not run to one thing after another, just to stay with one, to stay with one. I mean, for me, I, I do Zen practice and Judaism. To me, it's the same because it does say in the Torah over and over to meditate on me. Med come and meditate. Come to me directly. I see this in my view as an extension of the Torah. I really do. I really do. Everything in it to me is an extension of the Torah. Are you familiar with uh, Ari Kaplan's um, Jewish meditation book? Yeah, I am. I've read them. Yes, he was part of that group out in the old days with the Rebbe. Yes. So, so that was a more positive Orthodox group, open to um, to at least consider meditation for for Jews. Oh, sure. There, there are many, of course. I mean, there there there, there are very there are Jewish meditation. Europe. Um, I know in Manhattan there's a, a, a Jewish meditation group in Brooklyn. There are lots of them all over. Um, Memphis, I, I don't know what's going on in Memphis, I don't know, but it's just go on Google and, and, and look into Jewish meditation groups. There are many of them now all over. There really are. I, I, I don't go to them and I can't, I don't know what they, you know, they, they do something a little different than what I'm used to doing. You know, they, they'll, 
But they're all very good. They're all based on Torah, and you find what, as I said, what connects for you. Also, also, you know, just going to synagogue on Shabbat is the biggest meditation you could imagine. <laughs> the whole day is a meditation. Everything about the day is a meditation. It's a day of connecting to people with you. It's a day of, of thinking of God all day. It's a day of being with others. It's a day of prayer. It's a day of food. It's, it's, it's like a retreat every week. It's a deep meditation. Shabbat is one of the deepest. Just keeping it. Just keeping it. Try it. Try it once and see what happens. Find a place that you feel somewhat welcome in. That's the hard part. If you're more, if you, if you like meditation more and you're more open like that, then it's harder to go into certain synagogues because they're more rigid. You never know. See what's available. And there's also a thing called the chevrusas. I, you know, that's to create your own in your own house. Find a few people and practice together. The, the contention I had with Ari Kaplan in his book, Jewish Meditation, A Practical Guide, was that he was saying that the daily prayer that you say, if you're in synagogue, you say the Amidah twice, one with, with, a, with a cantor and one by yourself, and then you say the Amidah three times by yourself during the day. He was calling that a mantra, and to me it sounded like forcing uh, an outside concept into a Jewish one. And there was nothing wrong with him defining it like that, but it sounded kind of a little disingenuous to try to make it a little more sexy for, for modern audiences. Um, he's just tr he's trying to tr translate it, that's all. He's trying to be a translator to make it more contemporary. But, it, but, but it's what it is. What's the difference between chanting, Hebrew chanting, and chanting? Hindu chanting. It's the same thing. I mean, it's just different melodies, different words. But go, but, but go underneath all of that. Go underneath it. It's, it's all the same. It's crying out to God, isn't it? We really um, opened up our minds uh, about these things. And um, like, like you're saying, it's sad that people don't are not aware of certain things. So we're, we're spreading your message through this show. Um, we're doing a series on Eastern thought in, in the Jewish community. Hopefully we can get more people um, to share their perspective. That would be beautiful. That would be beautiful. But here in our intentional community, we have a lot of people who have been moved by Buddhism, by even Hare Krishna and other types of, um, of movements that were um, very popular in the 70s. And we think that there is, um, for the young people to know that there, are, there is stuff that is very powerful and has made an impact. Um, any closing thoughts? Um, we would like to extend an invitation to maybe have you on the show later so you can share more about this. But uh, what would you like to say? Well, I want to say how much I enjoyed speaking to you. And I want to thank you for the opportunity. Um, I want to say what you're doing is wonderful. It's really wonderful. I'd be thrilled to come back whenever you want me to. And um, I say right now with what's going on in the world, what you're doing is a blessing. And we need to bless each other and to, and to open our minds to... To all, you know, to feeling like sisters and brothers and, and, and to being close to everything that's the best, the highest and the best in all of us. So I, I want to, and I wish you very, all the blessings of your intentional community and uh, with the work you're doing, and I'd like you to keep in touch. Wonderful. And just one last thing. Um, I, I was involved with a traditional Sephardic group, and then I, I started to become a chaplain. And pe people are like, oh, you're just religious. And I'm like, I'm religious, but I'm also very aware of the importance of holding space for people, of respecting everybody's um, connection to God or the universe, allowing people to come to terms with, with their life struggles and, and being um, a quiet presence to, to support them. So all these clinical skills gave me an awareness and respect for other traditions and to be open. And so um, I, uh, I appreciate also the work that you do, um, sharing peop with people the, the importance of, of, of healthy living, healthy thinking, and, and being able to process their, their struggles through, through this. So that's wonderful work that you do. Well, thank you. I think it's wonderful what you do, and I love the Sephardim, by the way. I love it. I, 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 I prayed in a Sephardic shul for quite a while. Much, I feel very comfortable there. And, um, and, and I thank you, because I think you and I are in the same place of wanting to keep, an, of course, to, to be inspired by everybody's practice. And of course, 
of course, and to hold that space of respect and love for all beings. At the same time, keeping your own practice going, too. What could be better? Thank you for listening. We will be back next week with another episode of The Mystic and the Skeptic. Show descriptions and content are available online on our Facebook page and on SoundCloud.com. We would like to thank Radio Free Nashville for their technical guidance and assistance. Thank you.